As Richard mentioned, my topic is uh, the social determinant aspect of well-being and the need for a multi-pronged approach. And I'll be talking about some of our experience working in Musclebrook. Uh, we have a community well-being collaborative uh, called Musclebrook Healthy and Well. And I'd like to acknowledge the support that we've had through the community and through the Bengal Mining Company, who enabled us to launch this initiative in Musclebrook. I uh, also mentioned Carly Hughes, who's here today, she's our local coordinator, and then there's some of our members of our steering committee here as well, which is great to have you. So Musselbrook Shire is an area that's strongly um, tied to the mining industry. Um, uh, a large proportion of uh, people that work in Musselbrook work in the mines. But there's been, in recent years, a focus on economic diversification. And in parallel to that, there's been an increasing recognition of some of the social challenges that the community faces around uh, things such as education, there's less than a third of adults over the age of 15 that have completed high school, physical and mental health difficulties, crime, juvenile offending, family violence and child protection and so on. And it's not about focusing on the, on the needs or the challenges, but it's about recognising that underpinning some of these things, and when we talk to people in the community, uh, they live and work there. There's some other systemic difficulties that they, they're faced with as well. And some of these challenges can be uh, maybe symptomatic of some of those systemic challenges. So things like services being able to keep up with the demand due to lack of resources. Interagency referral and communication systems that sometimes can be ineffective. Limited public transport options can be a major barrier. Difficulties accessing health services community facilities and commercial venues can come up when you can't physically get there through public transport. Sometimes services and facilities aren't where they're needed most. So for example in public housing areas uh, where people are less likely sometimes to go and seek out services and there sometimes can be a lack of services available in those spots. Housing prices and uh, rental availability can also fluctuate depending on say the thermal coal prices. So there's I guess, a, a, an unraveling of some of these complex uh, difficulties. And the question for us is as a community wellbeing collaborative, what can we do when we're faced with these social and economic challenges? The reality is we have limited capacity to directly influence some of these aspects, particularly if we're working in isolation. But we also can't just go about business as usual because these things do affect our capacity to implement some of their health and wellbeing initiatives. We also know that it's vital to keep the community at the heart of our initiatives, but this isn't always enough on its own to address some of the complex systemic difficulties that might be outside the scope of the community wellbeing collaborative to address. So what we, find, what we found is that a structured, coordinated response involving government and non-government representatives is sometimes needed that can frame action plans and make strategic implementation decisions. There's an overlap with what Sue was talking about earlier here as well. So in Musclebrook, Musclebrook Healthy and Well, our collaborative functions underneath the Musclebrook Create Change Coalition. This is a community that brings together representatives from New South Wales Department of Premier and Cabinet, Police, Education, Transport, the local health district, Council, Aboriginal leaders in the community, the University of Newcastle, and the public housing provider in the area. This coalition is inspired by two models of collaborative working together. So there's the collective impact approach, and there's also the public health approaches around integrated care. And though these are usually used in different contexts, there's some overlaps between these two approaches around uh, working collaboratively to identify and address priority areas with a focus on community engagement and consultation. Efforts being supported by one or more local organising groups or organisations. Data sharing is encouraged as well and measurable outcomes being tracked like we were just talking about. And while these approaches are helpful in terms of getting our initiative off the ground, there are some practical challenges that we face along the way. So these include how do we make sure that we retain a bottom-up approach to our work rather than a top-down approach when you have government involved um, at that level. Making sure we're driven by community engagement and consultation, but in partnership with those who have the capacity to make some of these changes in terms of the structural and the systemic issues. 
working towards coordinated interagency data sharing is a challenge, so we can improve referral processes and service planning. Systems often aren't set up in rural areas in a way that supports this easily, but yet it can be very costly to make changes. So perhaps innovative, translatable and scalable models implemented across multiple regions are needed around data and communication and referral processes. Ensuring co-design approaches are used, involving the community, Aboriginal leaders and representatives from other marginalised groups to ensure that their voices are heard. And the other challenge is that sometimes initial enthusiasm can dissipate quickly. So how do you build and maintain momentum along the way and avoid wheel spinning? And lastly, that fostering local ownership is also important so you can have an eye towards sustainability of initiatives and so that when things maybe wind up in terms of a formal sense, how do you have local ownership around initiatives that can keep going? So we definitely don't have all the answers. But in our experience, just like with community wellbeing collaboratives that are works in progress, regional coalitions are also the same. But this kind of coordinated, systemic and multi-pronged approach can have the potential to drive new intervention models, evidence-based programs, policy frameworks, collaborations and structural changes that maybe can have potential to begin to uh, tackle some of these challenges around social determinants of wellbeing.